Hey, it's Jason Cunningham, and welcome back to another edition of Save My Business, proudly presented by Zero. This podcast is dedicated to inspiring small to medium sized business owners by sharing the insights and personal stories of successful business people. Today's guest, well, he's a great friend of mine, and to be honest, I'm pretty pumped to have him here. He's a father, a husband, an entrepreneur, a thought leader, and no doubt an ambassador for his industry, best known as hairdresser to the stars, the one and only, the great Joey Scandizo. Jeez, you make me sound good. You are good, Joey. Great to have you, mate. Thanks for taking the time uh, in your busy day of you know skiing down Mount Buller and, and being an ambassador. <laughs> <laughs> now, if, for those of you that don't know, Joey Scandizo is better known as the hairdresser to the stars. And the not so stars. But <laughs> Joey began life as a hairdresser, I think when he was about 15, Joey. Is 15, that about yeah, yeah. Yeah, nice young age. Dropped out of school and uh, had to find a job. And uh, here I am, 27 uh, years later and snipping hair still. Yeah, well, I mean, you play it down a fair bit, right? <laughs> but if we're to be honest, um, I remember when I was back in the Halcyon days when I was working on Channel 10, um, just as two-bit bloke in the background and <laughs> someone said, we need to get you fixed up. You need to see Scandizo. And went in and met you and, uh, and you know, the rest is history and we formed a great friendship. And what I guess what I got to learn about you is there's, there's two parts to Joey Scandizo. The one that you see in the public eye and, and, and the real Joey Scandizo. And for those of, the, of the, our audience that don't know you, you run a salon here on uh, Turek Road in uh, in the nice part of town. Uh, uh, but not only that, you, what, what have you got, about 15 or 16 hairdressers working here at the moment? No, uh, in this salon we have 32. Just so, 32. Yeah, so, so just so. miss that by a couple of comments. <laughs> Do your research, yeah. big fella. Uh, so we've got 32 hairdressers here, but you've also got a, a salon manager, Brenton. Yeah. yeah. Tell me about that. So we have, uh, we've got uh, three salon coordinators. So three people run the front of reception. They run the business for us, do all the ordering. Then we have two managers as well. So we've got me brother, who's a business partner, John, and yeah. another business partner, Joseph. So we all tackle this business. This is a beast of a salon. So yeah. this is our flagship salon. Uh, you couldn't run this on your own. It, no. is, it is a beast. When, you, when you're dealing with 32 staff, some of them between the age of 15 all the way up to you know 40 years old. So it's a mixed bag of staff. Uh, it's like the Big Brother house. Yeah, mixed personalities, different people. So you do need a big management team to pull something like this off. I saw a twinkle in your eye when you said the Big Brother house. We might come back to that a bit later yeah. on. Yeah. Um, wh- one of the things I know about you, Joey, is how you promote your staff or your team members. You know, and as I said, you could be forgiven to think it's the Joey Scandizo show, but in actual fact, it's not. And I know uh, one of your up and coming. Well, he's actually a star, Hermes. He is. Uh, tell me about right. Hermes. And he won Hairdresser of the Year award. Yeah, so right? Hermes has been with us now for just over 10 years. Yeah. A young kid came along looking for a job. At the time, we weren't looking for staff. And he was one of the guys, he sent about his resume about five times, knocked on the door, he used to ring me all the time. A lot of people in the industry said, stay away from this kid, he's trouble. Mm. Um, but, you know, me and him had a great relationship. I used to speak to him at a lot of um, the hair competitions and stuff along the way. And and he, he kept knocking on the door and he really wanted this job. So I chatted to my partners at the time. I said, look, this kid could be something. I can see he's got that sparkle in the eye. He's going to be a superstar. Everyone said, stay away. Don't don't touch him. Don't look at him. He's going to be trouble for your business. But I thought, no, there's something in this kid. So yeah. we had a crack. We took it on. We gave him a hard, stern uh, chat before he started. And 10 years later, he's here and he's just won hairdresser of the year last year. He's a superstar, great asset to this business, but yeah. just all around a great mate of mine as well. Yeah. So he's good to have around. And, and I think I, I think that can't be forgotten how you build this amazing culture in your workplace. Yeah. And whether you run a hairdressing salon, an accounting practice, a restaurant, any type of business, the culture of your organisation is important. Now, let's, uh, let's talk the truth here. One of the industries that got smashed the biggest during lockdown was hairdressing. Yeah, she said How did you manage to maintain the culture and then bring things back? And what did you do in the off-season, if you like? Yeah, look, it was probably the hardest time in our, in our business career. No one ever expected to be locked down for, you know, three months one year, then the following uh, year another three months. So it was hard. Mm. And we'd never been through this before, so we had to learn to navigate our way through this. And 
and you couldn't go to anyone for uh, you couldn't go to anyone for, for any advice because nobody had really been through it. So we chatted amongst ourselves to our industry, other industries, see what they were doing. Uh, we had our business part, my partners, who we sort of got together on a regular basis and just try to work out how we can get through this, you know. And we we're lucky and fortunate enough that the government supported our businesses throughout this time. But at the same time, we needed to get creative. So we created online stores. We created um, education. Mm. So we still kept active and we kept our staff active. So mm. we needed to keep the culture together. We kept constant contact. We had trivia nights. We had different things going on throughout that time just to keep their minds ticking mm. because a lot of them were flat, just yeah. like I was flat, but I couldn't show it. I had to be the guy. I had to stand up and say, hey, let's stick positive, let's stick tough. We'll get through this. And we sort of worked our way through it. And then we, we actually done a renovation on the salon. So when the staff could come back, they had something new. It was, it was mm. something fresh, a new opening, a new, a new venture, a new dawn, you know. So uh, we just had to keep busy, yeah. you know. And I, I, I'm personally, I can't sit still. So no, I had to keep true. my mind ticking. And, and along the way, we dragged people along. They got involved. They got involved in design, on the online store. People put their hand up because they just wanted to keep busy. So, mm. you know. Do we want to go through this again? Hopefully not. Hopefully it doesn't happen. But we did go through it and I think we got through it on the other end really well. Like business now is thriving and it's probably at its best it's ever been. Yeah, that's that's awesome to hear. I, I think other things that you've done and that you do with your culture, even before the pandemic, I know that you were keen, you offer gym memberships for your employees and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, so we, I mean, obviously it's not just about coming to work and, and just cutting hair here. Obviously, you know, we try and tailor to every single person. You've got people who want to be creative and do photo shoots, people who want to do fashion week, people who want to do competitions, people who want to do education. So there's so many different parts of this business and we mm. try and offer a different vehicle for each person. So mm. whether you, if it's education you want to go down, we open up doors for you in that, that mm. field, whether it's you want to be into competition. But then there's people who just want to come to work and do their job and earn a good living. So we offer like, you know, an F45 membership and, yeah. you know, there's we have uh, – instead we have go where we go to the go-karts as a team or we do a cooking class. So we try and just do things as a team, mm. obviously – having 32 staff in one building can get pretty tough. Yeah. So um, we just try and offer different things and, 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 you know, there's nights that we go to shows and, you know, competitions and then we, we've opened a salon up at Mount Buller. So mm. some of the team want to go up there, have a bit of a holiday, have a bit of a ski and then uh, do a bit of work. So, mate, 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 mate. let me pull you up there. Let's, <laughs> let's be honest here. The reason you've got a salon at Mount Buller is because you spend every weekend on the slopes. Look, I'm, right. a, I'm a big ski of the family of big skis, yeah. but th this happened through the pandemic because yeah. at the time I sort of got out of Melbourne. We had a place up at Buller. Uh, a lot of people were asking me to go do their hair at their place. Yeah. And I'm like, you know, I'm not, I don't want to be a home hairdresser. Yeah. But they, they just kept knocking on my door, ringing me while I was at Buller. I said, can you do my hair? And we thought, you know, what a great idea. Melbourne was closed, but regional was open. Mm. So I thought, let's open up a business here. So we spoke to the Grollos. We, we got a space in the chalet. Um, and we were, the first season, it was just rinsing hair out of uh, out of a wash out of a hand basin. We had like the old setup um, portable basin, and we're doing cuts and colours. The people up the bull loved it, and yeah. it just became something great. And then from there, it just grew, yeah. you know. And we kept that open for that season. The following season, there was still demand, and we thought, and I was up there, and we thought, let's just do it again. So then we did a big reno on the place. We actually turned it into a salon. And uh, this will be our third season. We open back up uh, as of next week and uh, the salon's booked for the first two weeks of the school holiday. So it's I, I think it's awesome. And what you're doing is you're meshing uh, culture and giving your team members the opportunity to almost go on a holiday, if you like, yeah, yeah. And also, but also work and get paid and build your brand up in a in another district. Yeah, I think it's a win-win for all. I mean, yeah. it's great for the salon, great for the, the brand. We've, we've picked up a lot of great clients from, from Buller who weren't clients here in Melbourne. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's great. Uh, some of the staff have put their hands up. They want to go up there. We've got one, two girls who are spending the whole season up there. Then we just rotate the staff in and Wonderful. out. You know, some want to do a week, some want to do half a week, some want to do three, four weeks. So I love going up there. Yeah. So I'm up there every weekend and I get to see my kids ski and I get to do what I love doing and yeah. I get to surround myself in um, the Buller. Now yeah. Buller. Joey, it'd be remiss of me not to bring this up early doors and a lot of people listening and watching this podcast uh, we'll be intrigued about the number of celebrities that you've met. And as re in as I know I saw on Instagram quite recently you were with uh, Al McPherson, you know, as a middle-aged or even over the, <laughs> over the middle-aged now. You know, she's someone that I had up on my wall. Tell me some of the celebrities that you've met and you've worked with. I mean, 
and maybe some of the stories that you might want to share. Maybe not attach the name to the story, but yeah. it's quite intriguing the amount of people that you've met in your time. Yeah, look, I've been fortunate enough. I've worked pretty hard to build a brand and name for myself. And obviously, people, celebrities come to Melbourne and are looking for their hair done. And sometimes my name comes up. So I've been fortunate enough to look after many people. Like you said, Al McPherson, I was just on the same with this thing with her last week doing an interview. This yep. week I've got the great Chase. It you know, <laughs> doesn't get any better. But no, yeah. we've had, uh, you know, Al McPherson, Paris Hilton, uh, Lindsay Lohan, uh, Anna Wintour, uh, Ruby Rose, Usain Bolt. Uh, who else is there? Um, Charlie Sheen. I mean, I can reel off many, many yeah. more, but there's been a lot Charlie of. Charlie Sheen would have been an interesting. It was an interesting one. That was for a uh, TV <laughs> commercial for Ultra Tune. He came out, we did his hair for that, and he yeah. had all these uh, entourage of strippers and all that for the, for the commercial. So that was a bit of fun that day. But, no doubt. Uh, no, I mean, and, and was the Jane list, on set? Yeah, no, she wasn't, unfortunately. <laughs> no, but. Um, so yeah, I've been lucky to to look after some of the you know great people. Priscilla Presley is a yeah, great wow. one. So here's probably a good story for you on, uh, if you if you want to hear a little story. Mm. She came out for the spring carnival um, probably about five six years ago, and I remember she was here for three days. I was booked with her for three days. First two days, did her hair. I asked her how do you want it done. She said, "Yeah, this this that." It was easy. And the, the next day she was going to the race and I asked her the night before, how would you like your hair done? And she said, I just want just exactly what you've done the last two days. Let's just do that. I thought, perfect. So I rock up. Next morning, I'm ready to go. We get into the room and I sit there and I go, right, yeah, so what are we doing? She goes, I've checked, she changed my mind. I've gone, right, yeah, <laughs> what are we going to do? And she goes, oh, I want the old 1920s finger wave. And I'm thinking to myself, I went to trade school and I uh, – I pretty much did nothing. I used to go in there and sign my name off and uh, meet girls. All I, yeah, meet girls, and all I wanted to do was cut hair. So all the uh, the old school styling, I sort of just skipped through all that and just signed that all off for myself. <laughs> so I'd never done any of it. So I was sitting there shit myself, and I looked at the apprentice who was there with me, and I said, "Look, you've got to know how to do finger waves." And she said, "Fuck no, I've never done it before." So I looked at the makeup and I said, you know what, today's the day. I think you should do the makeup first and I'll do the hair later. And she's like, why? Well, I said, you've just got to do the hair for the makeup first. YouTube. So she's gone off, but we've gone into the bathroom and YouTube and I've sat there for the <laughs> just practicing to mold this finger away and I'm thinking to myself. So we had about 45 minutes to an hour to practice this. <laughs> so I've done it. I've gone back and look, it looks okay, but it's, it's nowhere near finished. And I kept thinking to myself, look, we're lucky that she's got a fascinator. I've got to convince her to go the big fascinator so I can cover half of it. So anyway, we get in there and I start working this, this finger wave and, mate, I just start sweating. And, and, and I never get anxious. I never stress about it. I normally just take it on and just can go with it. But this is the first time in my life where I started stressing and I started sweating and I'm like, fuck, what do I do here? Like I was freaking out. And the apprentice is just looking at me going, is he going to die here or what? And she's on my back, rubbing my back, going, fuck, you know, cool down. So I looked at – and the good thing was Priscilla wasn't actually looking in the mirror. She was looking out – without Crown Casino, the world of entertainment. Right. She's got the big window. She's looking out to the view. Mm. So she couldn't see what was going on behind her. Mm. Meanwhile, I'm sweating. I'm going, yeah. fuck. This is a disaster. I said, I'm fucked here. So I said, righty, I've got to go. I said, I said look, Priscilla, I've got to go to the bathroom. Quick, do you mind? She said, yeah, no worries. So I've walked to the bathroom, just gone in there for towel, just towel myself down. I was sweating. And I've gone off – and I looked at myself in the mirror and said, Joe, pull your head in. You can do this. Yeah. I was talking to myself in the mirror, just trying to work my way through it. I go, right, I'm going out. And as I'm walking out, I go, I still stink. So I found her perfume, just sprayed her perfume all over. So, <laughs> so I'm not stinking. Going straight back out. And I just thought, get into it. So I convinced myself I could do it. And I sort of worked it. And it looked okay. Then I grabbed the biggest fascinator. And I said, I think you should go for this fascinator today. She's like, yeah, you're right. So I whacked the fascinator, pinned it in so I could hide most of it. So she <laughs> saw it. And then I brought it out the mirror, showed it. And she goes, oh, it looks beautiful. And I go, sweet. <laughs> so she's gone. I've done the cross. And God, I've saved myself here. <laughs> Went off and then she actually called me on the way and I think, fuck, I'm in trouble here. Mm. She probably hates it. She goes, oh, I want you to come with us. I go, what do you mean? She goes, I want you to be our guest for the day. I go, oh, right, here we go. I've got to have a share yeah, in the change. Share. <laughs> so I said, right, I'll meet you there. So I went down the track and it was Oaks Day, spent the day with her. And then uh, we just had a great relationship. And then five years later, early this year, I get a phone call from her. She, uh, Elvis is doing the big um, exhibition in uh, Bendigo. Yeah. She gave me a call and uh, I went there for two days and did the same thing again. So, did you tell her what happened with the with the I never wave? explained it, so I couldn't tell her, but <laughs> I, I've uh, told the story a few times. But um, yeah, it, it was uh, uh, something that I'll always cherish. She's been great for me. And to get me back, and she, um, we're going to the States next year, and she wants us to go visit Graceland, and she reckons she's going to meet us there. 
we'll see how that goes. But um, yeah, so most of the people I've worked with, I've kept a great relationship, like you saw last week with Al McPherson, done her hair a few times. She called me up, she's got a new product out. You know, she's coming back to Melbourne this year. So we just keep um, keeping contact, you know. And, and, and Paris Hilton, been back a few times, same yeah. thing. You know, she's brought me back on. So I just think, I've got that relationship where I'm like a not like a mate, but I I, I can just adapt to anyone. Any you're very person. relatable, Joey. Yeah. I mean, you've got a, one of the greatest surnames. You know, I love saying Scandi. <laughs> uh, but uh, no doubt you've got the branding and, and the marketing and the awareness down pat. And uh, as I've mentioned a couple of times in this podcast, a lot of people might think that that's all you do. But I know you as a person and you as a business owner, and I know that you're constantly when you're not here, you're ringing the salon, you're across the numbers. And it's not like you do everything willy-nilly for your team where they're at gym memberships and all that sort of stuff. You also cut across that by making sure that it is going to be – you're making the dollars. Is that right? 100%. I mean, oh, I, I was always a hairdresser who just wanted to be a superstar hairdresser, mm. just be the best. I went into business with a business partner years ago. That didn't work out. I didn't know enough about the business side back then, so I just relied on my business partner who I was with at the time to look after that. Unfortunately, things didn't work out the way I was meant to. I got involved with my brother and Joseph, my business partner, and then that's when it got serious. You know, it was about 10 years ago where I started looking at numbers and business and I just just naturally um, started to enjoy that side of it. Yeah. You know, it wasn't just about being the hairdresser anymore because hairdressing I could do and I could do that naturally and do good work, you know, and I knew how to train myself to be great at that. Yeah. And then I thought, hey, why don't I use what I've got there and, and do that in business and if I can do that – then I'm going to have both. You know, you want to be creative, but you want to have a great business. I don't want to be an artist, a starving artist. Yeah. And someone used to say to me all the time, you don't want to be a starving artist. And I like good clothes. I like fast cars. I like great holidays. And I wanted to make sure I could get both. Yeah. So that's where I sort of made that switch and gone, hang on, I'm going to work hard, but I want to make good coin doing it at the same time. Now, now with respect, um, a 15-year-old kid that leaves school starts cutting hair because his father said it's a great way to meet girls. <laughs> <laughs> uh, fast forward and now you're across the numbers and you're across an understanding the nuance of a business and what goes into making a successful business. How, how hard was that to adapt to and to learn? Look, the great thing was I enjoy what I do. So yeah. I actually love going to work. I love doing hair. I love networking. love going to events, meeting people. I'm fortunate enough that I cut some some of Melbourne's best mm. and, and most successful people. So I feed off them. They give me advice. So I, when I'm in the chair cutting hair, I'm actually building a, a network, meeting people, talking to people. They give me advice. Try this. Try. So I've experienced that. Yeah, so, <laughs> so 27 years of doing this, yeah. you're sort of learning along the way, you know. And the thing is, I'm a, I'm hungry. I, I'm a go. I surround myself with great people. Like it was my my closest mates to me are all successful in what they do. Mm. So we all feed each, off each other. We push each other to be the best. You know. And you, and you're not to you're not that he- ahead of yourself. You're humble enough to take advice from people that have been more successful than you in various different areas. One hundred percent. And I think a lot of business leaders or and entrepreneurs sometimes they get a bit ahead of themselves and yeah. they think that they know everything. Yeah. And what you're telling me is surround yourself with like-minded, successful people and take advice from people. 100%. But the, uh, as much as I love work and I love what I do, I love a, a life balance. Like, yeah. like I was saying, I love to snowboard, I love to surf, we love holidays. So it's finding that balance. You know, mm. I've just been away, I've, I've been away with the family to the Maldives, I've been with my business partner to Portugal, Copenhagen. I get back now and I'm re- roaring to go. Yeah. You know, I've, I just got back on, on Thursday night, Friday, Saturday, I'm in the salon. Mm. Monday, so went up to Buller Sunday, set that up for next week to open. Uh, so I've been with my accountant, bookkeeper as well today. Mm. I've been with some business partners in our products. So I'm just back. I'm ready to, I'm yeah. ready to launch. You know, yeah. I've had that break. And, and what's next? And when I'm overseas, I, I get to enjoy myself. But that's when I really get to look at the business from the outside. Mm. But sometimes when you're – I'm in here just cutting hair, cutting hair, cutting hair. Mm. You're just focusing on your clients. But when I step away from the business is where you really assess the business. Yeah, you know, wow. And you go, fuck, this is where we need to get to. What are, what are other brands doing? What are other yeah. sellers doing? What are other businesses doing? You know, what are other industries doing? So like I said, I'm lucky enough that I get to speak to the CEO of Coles. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, there's so, Paul, Paul, there's so many names and, and some mm-hmm. of the clients who come in here who I, who I get to feed off and get ideas off. And, yeah. Um, yeah. Well, what I think is profound, and again, I say this with respect, but it's not often that you'll talk to a hairdresser who talks about the importance of getting off the tools 
and working on your business and taking that helicopter view and that strategic view. That took that took a while for me to do. Yeah. Because I was always like, cut hair, cut hair, cut hair, do every celebrity in town, do this, do that, do the awards, mm. do the comps. And until I learned that, hey, I actually need to spend some time away from the from mm. just cutting hair is mm. when I really worked it all out. I've gone, we need to be a brand. We need people to know who, who this brand is. To, because the more I'm out in the, uh, in the field doing an event, doing a pop-up, networking, the more I can put bums on seats for the rest of our staff. Yeah. Our staff are in here, they're good workers and, and they can bring in from word of mouth clients. But I try and get that extra clientele from mm. them to bring them in to open the door up for them as well. Can I expense this? What I uh, am intrigued about is your other business interests and how you've given a leg up to, you know, you've got a, quite a few barber salons and a few blow waving salons. Yeah. Can you talk about the impotence of that and why you went into that and how you're supporting others and, and how yeah. that works for you? So obviously we were, a, we were a seller when we started this first business, our flagship seller, and we had, you know, 10, 15, 20 staff that started to build bigger mm -hmm. and bigger. We started to outgrow this salon. This salon became, it couldn't fit in anyone. We were knocking back people. You know, you look at the, can I look at the cancellation list every day and there'd be 20, 30 deep of people wanting to get in. Wow. I'm thinking, I'm losing here. Yeah. You know what I mean? I'm like, that hurts. Yeah. And you've got clients who have been regular with you for years. You couldn't even get them in. So I'm like, this, this is killing our business, our brand. And at the time, the barber shop idea came up and uh, there was a, sh a store across the road. I just traveled to the States and saw. Uh, there was a few barber shops starting to pop up in Australia. There was not many at all, especially in Victoria. There would have been a few people doing it, starting to do it. Like they were around years ago in the mm. 80s. It was all about men's, women separate. Mm. Then it became cool to be in the salon together. So I saw this this gap in the market, and I thought, you know, this could be an idea. Let's get out. Let's open a store across the road. Let's create a new brand. And at the time, I had a, a guy who was working with me for years, Aaron Chan, ripping guy, mm -hmm. talented. He was going overseas and he was looking at getting out of the industry. He wanted to become a carpenter. I'm like, this guy's too good. He's got so much talent, mm -hmm. but he just wanted something different. So I jumped on a call. I said, hey, I've got this idea. What do you think? And he was overseas at the time. In, I think he was in Argentina and he saw barber shops at the same time as well. And I said, let's do this in Melbourne. And he's like, do you think it'll work? I said, mate, it will work. I've got, out of our salon here, we used to do say 70% female and 30% male. Now the male part of the market used to take up a big chunk of this salon. Now when you're talking about average spend, women were up here, men were down here, mm. but they'll take up the same amount of space. So I thought if I can pull those men out of here, drag them across the road, set up a new unique place that nobody's doing, you know, the, the barber shop, the shaves, the cold beers, mm. Nobody was doing it. This could work. I said, trust me, I'll get 30% of these clients. I'll tell you that. I guarantee you overnight they're going to move across the road. Yeah. He's like, are you sure? I said, mate, I guarantee you. I'm going to feed these guys across the road. So we did. We opened it up. All the males went across the road. Some of the men like yourself who <laughs> like to sit around and surround themselves by females <laughs> stayed and still are to this day stayed here, which I don't mind. Yeah. But uh, So we bumped our male prices up here and we kept our male price the same across the mm. road. So the, the transition worked out perfect. But in here, that just relieved. So if we were doing 500 clients a week, mm. that gave me about 100, 150 more spaces for women to come in. So then all, the, all what happened then was the women, more women got in here, the price went up. Profits went up. Profits went up and it was ching-ching all around. We were happy as a business. Across the road, I, I just had a young guy who was hungry, was going to leave the industry. I brought him back into the industry. Yeah, wow. So we opened our first and that just became success. Within a year, we opened up our second location in the city and now there's six or seven of them and we've got a school, an academy of men's barbering. So that just started from there. And then what we do, each seller that opens up, normally one of the guys will be working in our business. We sort of mentor them. And then we sort of invite them in as a partner and a shareholder in in the business as well. And I that's just, how it grows. It, just, it was just an idea and, and you just learn along the way. You grow and you try things. I mean, out of the shops, we've had a couple of um, – some, some of our partners have, have gone in and done it three, four years and then probably moved on, but yeah. some, most of them have hung around. And what's the name of that brand? Uh, King's Domain Barbers. Yeah. You know, I, I mean, the amount of lessons in business that I just heard then, right, the – I don't know, 10 different lessons that is adaptable to any business. Yeah. You, you've seen 
You've, you've looked at your business and seen, okay, what are the challenges? I've got a waiting list. I'm knocking people back. And as an entrepreneur, as a business owner, yeah. turning money <laughs> away, that fucking kills, right? Yeah. Uh, so you go, okay, well, what can I do? You've gone overseas. You've seen where the market's going overseas. Yeah. This could work in Australia. You've backed yourself in. You've got a guy who was a gun that said, I'm out of here. And you go, yeah. no, 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 hang on. I'll give you a leg up. Yeah. Have an equity piece in the business. And don't worry about the clients. I'll feed them in there. Next minute, Bob's your uncle, Fanny your aunt, and Scandizo's away again, the big fella. <laughs> um, which I, I, I just think, because, you know, I, I've known you now for a few years, yeah. right? And uh, and when I first met I mean, this is only the second time I've seen you with a shirt on, Scandizo. <laughs> but <laughs> I can just Jack. imagine you in the Maldives, oiled up, you yeah. know, doing your strategic plan. No, but in, in all sincerity, you are very much a person that believes in the more I give, the more I get. And I was lucky enough to get in here because yeah. I know the waiting list. And luckily, <laughs> I knew somebody. I got myself in here, um, and yeah, and we've remained friends ever yeah. since. And you know, I really enjoy the time sitting in the chair because you're giving me advice. I'm giving you advice. Yeah. You're hanging shit on me. I'm hanging <laughs> shit on you. And it's sort of this one upmanship. But what you are all about is you're about your people. Yeah. Whether they are, you know, the apprentice that started. Whether it's young Hermes who's running around with the trophy. Well, here's a person. Hermes is the same example. Hermes was a young guy. He was hungry. He was doing all the awards. And he, he sort of got a bit flat and he wanted his own thing and he wanted a salon. Yeah. So we worked on a, on a piece in Richmond for, um, you know, he wanted this salon. He wanted his name in lights. I said, sweet. Okay, we're going to do this. So we planned it. He was excited. We were excited. And we talked to him along the way and said, look, business isn't what it's saying. Yeah, mm-hmm. these are the, things you, the challenges you can find, this and that. But he was like, hungry, hungry. I've got to do this. I've got to do this. So I was sort of stuck on the fence. I'm like, is he ready for it? He was definitely ready for it, right? Yeah. But could he deal with the pressure of business? I was like, I find it hard as well, but yeah. I've got three or four people around me here every day that sort yeah. of can help me through it. Yeah. So we said, okay, let's give this a go, right? So we gave him an opportunity where he could have invested in here or he could have done his own, but he really wanted to do his own. So we said, right, let's back him, you know? Yeah. A few people had their doubts, but I said, no, nah, this guy, he's, he's given me loyalty for how many years? I'm going to back this guy, right? I'm going to give this guy this. He's got to do this because if he doesn't, he'll regret it for the rest of his life. So we did it. A couple of weeks into it, I get a phone call. He's in tears. I'm not sure if this is for me, rah, rah, rah. And I'm like, you know, I said, mate, you've got to stick this out for a bit longer. Mm. So we gave him a halt. We said, look, you've got to do a year trial. But sometimes when you try something new, uh, it's, you know, you're like you're away from home, you get homesick. So we tried it, but it, it wasn't for him. And he, he knows it as well. And, and we said, look, you know, the doors were open back here. We said, look, come back if you like, come back in here. And then we end up selling the business and he's happier than ever. And now he's gone on and won hairdress of the year. So it's not doom and gloom in the yeah. end of the world. So yeah. sometimes business doesn't work out the way you want it to be. I've been lucky that most things have, a mm. few things haven't. But like I said to him, is keep your chin up, you move on. And he's gone to bigger and better things. He's won the awards, he's up there, he's traveling. And you were his and biggest shows. promoter. You you pumped him up and often- he, some, he's, he's a star. Uh, he like, is he's, a star. He's, 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 look, yeah, he's naturally, he's just gifted. He's, out of all the hairdressers I know, he's probably the most gifted, talented yeah. hairdresser I know. Well, your right? brother John reckons he's number one. But anyway, <laughs> we'll get to John in a minute because he's a good man, John. Yeah. Um, but, you know, when I spoke to Hermes off camera yeah. and he said, look, I said, oh, what's your surname? He goes, mate, I've only got one name. Hey, <laughs> I've got Madonna. Madonna, Madonna at the back. Yeah. Hey, oh, it would be remiss of me not to talk about Eleven, um, yeah. the products that you are a, a, a part of. Can, yeah. you, can you share with me that journey? And I'm interested. I, I love where the name came from, from as well. Yeah. So that was, um, you know, we, I'd, I'd sort of I'd had my business set up. I'd... I'd you know, doing the celebrities, traveling the world, one hairdresser of the year. I sort of achieved a lot of things and it was like, what's next for, for, for myself? You yeah. know? And at the time, I was working with a photographer, Andrew O'Toole at the time. We were doing a lot of work together. And we are working with a lot of other brands. So I was an ambassador for Weller, Sebastian, doing stuff for GH. So I was doing all these things for different brands, you know. Uh-huh. And then all these brands were coming to me, offering me opportunities as ambassadors, this and that, which was great. Like, and I was learning a lot along the way. But I just said to a mate once, I'm like, mate, we're going to do something for ourselves. You know, there's an opportunity. And then a lot of people said, hey, don't go down that path. It's too hard, you know. And when someone says that to me, I automatically go back. I'm doing it. I'm doing it. <laughs> here's, me, here's me a chance. So we had a good chat, me and my mate Andrew, who's a photographer at the time. And um, we had another group of mates who run a distribution company called Ozdare, And they had a couple of brands on their belt. And we were chatting one night after a few beers. And they said they were looking at doing a brand. So... Mm. They had distribution, marketing covered. We had creative, me and my mate Andrew. We thought, you know, let's get together. So the group married. We became uh, one unit and um, we came up and we, we created this brand called 11 Australia. 
in 2011. So simple. We, everyone threw a few names around. There was this great southern land and there was gypsies and there was all these different <laughs> shit names that everyone put in the barrel. One guy put 11 in there and uh, that's how the name 11. Um, right, because it was established in 2011. That was 11. Simple and easy because our brand was all about being simple and easy. Yeah. The products needed to tell you what they did. They needed to be simple, but they just need to work. You know, We didn't overcomplicate anything. So we're about 11 years in now. Uh, I just got back from Portugal with our European distributors. So all up around the globe, we have about 32 countries who stock the brand. You know what I like about that just there? You, you slip in that I just got back from Portugal trying to say that that was a tax deductible trip. <laughs> right? That's good from you. <laughs> <laughs> hey, let me tell you, it wasn't. <laughs> I then went to Copenhagen because we've got a, a head office. Our European head office is in Copenhagen. There's about yep. 15 staff who work there. But once again, <clears throat> it started off as... One product, <coughs> sorry, I'm going to start off with one product, Miracle Hair Treatment. We had about 10 guys on the road around Australia selling that one product. It was our hero product, uh, gives your hair 11 benefits your hair will love. Miracle Hair Treatment, for anyone out there, you've got to use it. <laughs> but uh, that was the start. And then from there, we created shampoos, some styling products, and now there's about you know 35 SKUs in the range. Wow. Um, we've got tools, brushes, masks, uh, body moisturizers, body washes, and the brand just keeps evolving. Um, but like I said, there's, I think it's about 32 countries now we're stocked globally. Mm. Um, massive in the US, North America, Canada, um, Australia, New Zealand, and Joey a lot of Europe. Joey Global Scandizo. It's <laughs> <So laughs> Scandizo, it's 11 Australia. We've got- <laughs> no, yes, that's good for yeah. you. Well done, uh, brand ambassador. Hey, before we finish up, I want to talk about something that's close to your heart, yep. and that's the education piece in your industry. now. Yep. You know, as I said, you, you're, you're a thought leader, you're an entrepreneur, but you're also a big advocate for your industry yeah. and, and you're big on education. Let's talk about your academy and how that works. Yeah. And, and is it only for Scandizo employees or, or tell me how that works? So we have a few academies. So the one that we run here is the Joey Scandizo one, which is run by Joseph, my business partner. Mm -hmm. He looks after all the education. So mm -hmm. Joseph... He loves education, it's his thing. Do they learn their finger wave in the event that Pr Priscilla Presley? <laughs> no, but I've just put that into, after that event, we put it into our uh, into our documents. No, but uh, Joseph runs that, and that's only solely for our own salon. So we, we you can obviously go to a trade school or you yep. could do in-house training. So it's a massive investment for us. Is it the same qualifications? Exactly the same qualifications. So you can actually go to a trade school, send your staff there, and it costs you hardly anything, right? Yeah. Or you have to invest. So we've got three or four educators We've got rent for an academy. We've got to set it all up, set the place up. So it's a big cost for us. But we see doing our own education, I can see the value in it, and there's a return. So wow. it's easy to send them to school. They get a, you know, they get, they don't get as. I don't think they get the quality that they get through our, our own own education. So that's why we invest in it. Like it's a big investment. Okay, so a kid leaves school, wants to become an apprentice hairdresser. Yeah. Gets an opportunity to work for Scandizo, yep. and they do their study here. They do it here, so yep. they, they so they're still got to go through the um, the TAFE program, the TAFE program, yep. right? Yep. But all the um, all the practical stuff is done here. So all the theory stuff, they can do it online, or they go into one of the TAFEs. But all the practical stuff that they need to pass off, we just know that the quality that they can get through here is much more advanced, and mm. they become a much better hairdresser on the end. Yeah, and. So some cynical business owners will think, the last thing I want to do is spend all this time and money and train my staff or my team members, Nobody and then all of a sudden I'm going to lose them. And that, that's the risk you take. Yeah. So we just have to make sure we create an environment that the staff want to be here and want to hang around. I'll, I'll, look, I'll be honest, not everyone makes it through the no. apprenticeship and not everyone stays here for 10 years. But I've got, you know, out of the 30 staff here, there's probably 12 to 15 of them who have been here for more than seven years plus. Yeah, wow. I mean, some guys have been here for 12, 13, 14 years, mm. 15 years. So we set it up. So there's a future for them. But this place isn't for everyone. Mm. You know what I mean? Over the years, you've had people come and go. Mm. Um, but we try and build this so they are here for a long time. We make sure there's a great road and a great future for everyone. And we try and you know create that path for them. So tell me, what's next for the Joey Scandizo Empire? So at the moment, we're focusing on, like I said, we've got the education, we've got our salons. We're not going to really be looking at opening any more salons. Mm -hmm. um, the industry is in a tough position at the moment there. We just don't have the staff coming through. Yeah. Young kids like in the 80s and 90s, everybody wanted to be a hairdresser. You know, mm -hmm. there was that TV sh uh, movie Shampoo, which mm -hmm. Warren Beatty years ago, and yeah. everyone, that was the, the movie and everyone wanted to become a hairdresser. Yeah. We don't have that movie at the moment. So no. if you want to produce one and I'll be the star, <laughs> we can do it. 
<laughs> no, but nobody's choosing hairdressing as many hairdressers as we used to mm. uh, going into the force. So we're just looking at it now and trying to position ourselves. We've got a great some great businesses at the moment. We're going to consolidate on those and stick with those. Um, and products is the way we're going. Uh, yeah. You know, products is probably our, our biggest thing. So I've got Eleven Australia, which takes up a lot of my time now. Mm. I, I love innovation. I love uh, working with chemists and creating products. Mm. Never thought I'd be down. Like I used to go in science classes and switch the Bunsen burner and light up the Bunsen burner. That was science <laughs> for me. Yeah. Flick, you know, 15, 20 years down the track and mm. you're, you're mixing with chemists and talking about key ingredients and mm. shit like that, which... Who would ever thought? I, yeah. I got into hairdressing. I was a high school dropout. Yeah. And no, I was shit house at school. Yeah. Um, the, the teacher said to me, oh, man, you've got to find this guy a job. I tried carpentry. I tried plastering, yeah. a couple of other shit jobs. And then the old man one day goes, give hairdressing a go. I said, what am I going to do that for? And he goes, yeah. mate, trust me, you work in the indoor environment. In the, when it's hot, you got the air con. When it's cold, you got the heating on. And he goes, you're surrounded by women all the time. Fuck, this sounds great. <laughs> and, uh, and that's why I chose it. And that's where I met my, my beautiful wife, by yeah. the way. So, and, yeah. you know, did you think you were going to get into business? Did you think you would have academies? Did you think you would do hair product? No, I, I never would have ever thought that. Yeah, wow. You know, but I am I'm pretty driven. Like, mm. I, I want to succeed and I want to be great at what I do. I want to create a great future for myself, my family, my kids, mm. and whoever's around me as well. Like, mm. some of these guys here who have gone to business with are living a great life. And mm. for he, for them to come up to us and say, I'm doing this and that is great because we're all winning. Yeah. And that, the most I, important yeah. thing is yeah. whoever's a part of this is winning. Yeah. And I, I, I do. Um, I do see your focus on that synergy piece, the win-win, you yeah. know, synergy where the whole becomes greater yeah. than the sum of the parts. The relationship you have with your brother, John yeah. and Joseph, you know, the banter that goes on with you three in the <laughs> chair number one, two and three. Uh, yeah. You know, God forbid <laughs> anyone sit in the wrong chair or, or touch his blow dry, I'll tell you right now. <laughs> hey, as we finish up, what would be the first three tips that you would give any budding young entrepreneur, not necessarily a hairdresser, yeah. but going into business, what are the three things that you think are important to focus on to give them the best chance of being successful? Look, I think uh, you got a plan. Yeah. Like actually don't just go in, dive in head first. Like actually really think about it. Mm. Find some mentors, mm. like speak to people who have been who are in the industry or people you know who are close to you. And surround yourself with the best. Yeah. I've always said if you surround yourself with good people, whether it's a good accountant, mm. good solicitor, uh, just great mates, good friends, feed off their energy and their vibe is always and, – and don't be afraid to work because I'll tell you now, like people see Joey Scandese as a guy who snowboards and yeah. surfs yeah. and travels the Maldives and here and there, but yeah. trust me, you speak to my wife yeah. and she says he's, ne he's, ne he's hardly ever home, you know, yeah. not like – well, this week, so yesterday I went to the snow, had a bit of time out with my mates um, and on the weekend I was with Jane. But then come tonight I'll be out till about 10 o'clock because we've got our, KD, our Kings Domain directors meeting. Tomorrow night we've got our Joey Scandizo directors meeting. Thursday night we've got our Uber Cell and directors meeting. So I'm not home any of those nights. Yeah, wow. Friday night, Jane will be up at the snow. She'll take the kids up because I've got to work Saturday. So I still work on a Saturday on the yeah. floor. So it's easy to say, hey, I'm the owner, I don't need to work, but I work Thursday, Friday, Saturday on the floor. Friday night, I get the boys around, have a poker night, so there's a bit of fun along the way. And then uh, Sunday, Monday, kids are up at Bullard, school holidays, I'll spend some time with them. Yeah. But I'll still be on the phone, still be doing Zoom calls. So it's just trying to balance your life. Yeah. And, and, and the most important for me, if I'm not having fun, and anyone will tell you, if I'm not having fun along the way, I'm out. Yeah. So my life has to be, I've got to have those sports and those fun things to do, mm. but i still got the passion to work. I'm not afraid to go to work and do three, four days a week, Client, you know, squeeze a client in here, squeeze a client in there. You, you'll, you, know, you, you might ring me up and go, fuck, Joey, I'm going overseas, I need a haircut tomorrow. You'll never ever see me say, nah, can't get you yeah. in. I'll be like, mate, come in in the morning, I'll be there at seven o'clock for you, I'll come in in my lunch break, come in here. I'll try and make everyone happy. No, you do. Like Joey Scandizo, you're a great man. Thank you for Thanks, today. Mate. This is uh, <laughs> outstanding. I learned a lot in business. And, um, yeah, I, I told you had a shitload on today. I even <laughs> made this happen. <laughs> Thanks, big fella. Uh, cheers. Well Thanks for having us.